You're listening to the Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. I think 10 years from now, we're going to look back on this year's team and people are going to say, those guys all rode on the same team together. It reminds me a little bit of the early 80s when the Renault Elf Cycles Jatan team had Bernard Hinault and Laurent Fignon and Charlie Mote and Greg LeMond. All those guys were on this one team together. And you're going to probably say that about Adrian Costa and Teo Gegenhardt and Eddie Dunbar and Ruben Guerrero and Nielsen Paulus, it, these these are the guys that you'll see 10, 15 years from now right, right in the Tour de France. Hello, my name is Richard Moore, and on behalf of myself, Lionel Burney, and Daniel Freib, and everybody at the Cycling Podcast, a very happy new year to all of our listeners. Our regular weekly episodes will resume next week, but we're starting this year in what we think is an appropriate, forward-looking way, featuring some of the stars of the future, perhaps even this year. The voice you heard at the start belongs to Sean Whitey, the press officer to the under-23 team Action Hagens Berman, which under Axel Merckx has become the world's top development team. Alumni include Ben King, first ever rider on the team, Taylor Finney, Alex Dowsett, Lawson Craddock, George Bennett, Ian Boswell, Nate Brown, Joe Dombrowski, Jasper Stuyven, and many others. We're going to hear in this episode from Axel Merckx, the son of Eddie, of course, and from one of his riders from last year, Teo Gagan Hart, who has now turned pro for Team Sky. We'll also hear from Adrian Costa, one of the very brightest young prospects in world cycling, a young American or French-American rider. In the second part, we'll turn our attention to another development team, uh, one with quite a different ethos. It's the team that races under the name of Alberto Contador uh, for his foundation, in fact, and which is run by Contador's brother, Fran. As I said, the regular podcast with Lionel Daniel and myself will return next week. Uh, but there's been a lot going on. Uh, we will talk about that properly next week, but it would be remiss to ignore all the news completely. So let's begin with Lionel's News Roundup. Over to you, Lionel. Happy New Year to all of our listeners. The New Year hangover goes on for Team Sky and Dave Brailsford over the TUE that was applied for to allow Bradley Wiggins to take a banned steroid called Triamcinolone shortly before the Tour de France in 2011 and 2012 and again before the 2013 Giro d'Italia. Just before Christmas, Brailsford, Shane Sutton and British Cycling's President Bob Howden appeared before a Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee hearing into doping in sport. Brailsford finally revealed publicly what he believed to be in the jiffy bag, which was taken by British cycling coach Simon Cope to France on the final day of the 2011 Dauphiné Libre. He said it was a decongestion called Flumacil, which is a product available over the counter at pharmacies in France. We discussed this a little bit in our Bradley Wiggins special episode episode Full Circle, which was released just before Christmas. We'll no doubt discuss it again because the controversy has rumbled on this side of Christmas as well with first Chris Froome and then Dave Brailsford speaking to the media in the past week or so. Talking to the BBC, Froome repeated something that he told David Walsh of the Sunday Times in November 2015 and that was that he had decided against applying for a TUE during the final week of the 2015 tour when he was struggling with bronchial issues because he felt it was morally wrong. However, it's important to bear in mind that Froome had applied for and been granted TUEs for a substance called prednisolone twice in his career, including during the 2014 Tour of Romandy, which he won. So the story gets less clear as the days go on. Wiggins has been keeping a low profile, but has nevertheless been in the news. It's been announced that he's to be a contestant on Channel 4's The Jump, which is one of the more dangerous reality TV style shows. It sees celebrities competing in a range of winter sports, including ski jumping and bobsleigh. It's also been announced that he's no longer represented by his agency, 19 Entertainment, and he's signed with Sachi Merlin instead. And he's also signed a three-year endorsement deal with car manufacturer Skoda. Meanwhile, David Kenworthy, the outgoing chairman of UK Anti-Doping, criticised Brailsford for the lack of clear detail offered at the Culture, Media and Sport Select Committee hearing. This week, Brailsford hit back, telling the BBC and other media that Kenworthy was basically out of order for speaking about an ongoing investigation. He also refused to clarify whether he feels he has Froome's backing as Team Sky's boss. 
that's just the headlines the story goes deeper and deeper and no doubt we will discuss this in next week's episode in other news the tour of qatar has been cancelled along with the ladies tour of qatar the men's race had been upgraded to world tour status but it's been cancelled because of a lack of sponsorship although a skeptic may also note that qatar's interest in the cycling may well have waned now that the world championships have been held there the first tour of Qatar was held in 2002 and Tom Boonen can probably be considered king of the desert after a record four overall wins and 22 stage wins. The race will be remembered for the occasional thrilling day of havoc caused by crosswinds and there's no doubt the classics riders have lost an important preparation race. Sticking with cycling in the Middle East, it was confirmed in late December that the Lampre Merida team would become UAE Abu Dhabi. This ends Lamprey's association with professional cycling which stretches back to 1991 on and off and it also leaves Italy without a team registered in the UCI World Tour or its equivalent for the first time in well ever. The team was supposed to have been taken over by the Chinese TJ Sport organisation but that fell through and the United Arab Emirates have stepped in to save it. They've retained most of the Lampre riders, Louis Menkes, the former world champion Rui Costa, Diego Ulissi and much of the rest of the Lampre roster and they've also added Britain's Ben Swift and Colombia's Darwin Atapuma. Just to confuse matters, Lampre's old co-sponsor Merida will be co-sponsor of another Middle Eastern team, Bahrain Merida, featuring Vincenzo Nibali. We'll talk more about them in coming weeks too. Belgian Janny Meersman's retired because of a heart condition. You may remember he won two stages of the Vuelta for Etix Quickstep and had been due to move to the Fortuneo Vital Concept team. There have been reports that Nairo Quintana will ride the Giro d'Italia before the Tour de France, which is tantamount to handing the Tour on a plate to Chris Froome, some have suggested. On December the 29th, it was announced that Ferdi Kubler had died at the age of 97. He was the oldest surviving winner of the Tour de France. The Swiss won the Tour in 1950 and the world title in 1951, as well as a couple of editions of Liège Baston Liège. It means that the current oldest surviving winner of the Tour de France is now Roger Valkoviak. The British National Championships will be held on the Isle of Man, which is good news for Mark Cavendish and Peter Kennock, who come from the island. Less good news in the south of France is that the stage race La Méditerranéenne has been shortened to two days because of a shortage of police to do the road closures. And the Etoile de Bessage, another of the early season stage races on the south coast of France, may suffer the same fate. Meanwhile, Paris-Nice has announced the route for the 27 race in March. The standout stage is a 14.5 km uphill time trial on Montbrouille. The final stage will finish on the Quai des Etats Unis, which is a little way along the coast from the traditional finish on the Promenade des Anglais, and that's because there is a period of memorial after the terror attacks on Bastille Day last year. That's not everything that's happened over the Christmas period, but it's a good summary. We'll be back with more news next week. Thank you for that, Lionel. And as I said, the regular podcast will resume next week. We are very grateful this year to be sponsored once again by Rafa, uh, who've been sponsoring us since the Tour de France last year and will continue their partnership with the Cycling Podcast throughout 2017. Thank you very much to Rafa. Also, Science and Sport, a new sponsor, dipped their toes in the water at the Giro d'Italia with the Cycling Podcast last year, and they're back for the whole year, 2017. Very grateful to Science and Sport as well. We will be uh, bringing you a weekly podcast. Thanks to those two partners, Rafa and Science and Sport. So I spent some time speaking to the action team at the Tour of Utah last August, um, where they were really, really impressive. They were up against some of the the World Tour teams, um, but for my money, they were the most impressive team in the race, the most aggressive. They were in every break. They clearly had a different plan every day, using different riders, different attacks on different terrain. They really did animate the race, to use a a word that we probably banned at one point last year, but I've uh, just resurrected it for the first week of this year's podcast. Fantastic. Anyway, Adrian Costa was the standout performer, 18 at the time. He turned 19, I think, a week or so after the race ended. But he ended up second overall just behind Lachlan Morton, who's back in the World Tour this year, of course, with Dimension Data. And third overall was Andrew Talansky, who went on from Utah to finish fifth at the Vuelta. So a really impressive performance over the week from Adrian Costa. What is the special alchemy of this team? Because they've had a lot of success over the last few years. Is it is it Axel Merckx? Is it his recruitment policy, his management, uh, or something else? Here's Sean Whitey again. I think originally it was the, the enticement was to be able to ride under someone like Axel Merckx who has not only the name and pedigree but also he wanted to guide the young kids and now 
over time, it's been that the program itself has is, is become so illustrious that everyone wants to be a part of it. So it's almost like a, a college football team where they, they have, they've recruited all these great guys and now they've established a tradition. And so you've seen over the first uh, nine years of the program, 18 riders go to the world tour. What's interesting is obviously it's an American team primarily and Axel's a Belgian, although he's quite Americanized. He rode for American teams himself. But America does seem to have a, a real culture of working well with young athletes at school and, and college. Has, has that somehow been a factor in, in the way this team has developed? I think more than that has been Axel wants to teach these guys the professional way from the very get-go. And you, you're, we're standing here right now at the start of a stage before the Queen stage of the Tour of Utah, and we're the only team here that doesn't have a bus. And he doesn't want to pamper these guys. He wants them to learn the professional way right from the get-go. And I think guys nowadays want to know that. They want to know how to do things and, and learn the right way before they move up. And sometimes people move up too quickly and they don't learn all the nuts and bolts that go into being a professional cyclist. Theo Gagan Hart is a rider who is well known to the cycling podcast. Of course, we've interviewed him a few times over the years. He's been with Axel Merckx's team for three years now and is off to join Team Sky in 2017. But at Utah, I asked Theo what makes Axel Merckx's team so special. Yeah, I think the fact that all the riders are under 23s, it means we have the passion and the excitement to race in common and, and also really the hunger and the desire to succeed and to move up and to take something from every day. I think you, you hear those kind of words a lot, especially in British cycling, about the hunger and, and uh, the drive and the willingness to sacrifice. And if you do that as a group, uh, invariably it's a lot easier. And, and you also build on each other's success. And, uh, and that's kind of what's happened this year. We've been on a roll, I think, a little bit, and we've won a lot of bike races. And uh, we started early and we just kept going. We always have guys that have been uh, on this team dispersed through the peloton actually in every race I've ever done in every pro race I've ever done whether it's like Stuyven on Trek or Boz on Sky or Joe the defending champ here on on Cannondale we have like a variety of different guys and I remember in my first day of pro racing in, in California 2014 I was in the break and uh, a big group came across with Brad and Boonen and Cav and all these huge names and I've been in the break for about 200 k's at this point I felt his hand on my back and Stoyven pushed me right in the line onto Brad's wheel. And uh, yeah, I did about three turns before I was absolutely dead. But it's little things like that that do make the difference. But I think it's also important to remember that the team turns over, you know, up to 50% every year. I think this year it's almost going to be 50% of the, of the 16. That legacy and, and having the confidence that guys have gone before you and, and been successful is great. But it's also always just about the group that you have at that time and working together and and I think this is a really easy thing to say and, and maybe a bit of a cliche in, in sport or in cycling but when we go to under 23 races especially I really noticed that how much we buy into each other compared to some of the uh, equivalent teams and, and how we race together and how uh, dialed we are and I think part of that comes from doing these big pro races because you have to be like that you don't survive in these races without riding as a team whereas in the under 23 races it's, it's a different matter. Whoever you are, whatever you ride, whatever the reason, Rafa exists to improve your ride with the finest kit, inspiring stories and vibrant clubhouses and communities all over the world. On the final day of the Tour of Utah, I sat down with Axel Merckx, who as well as being the son of Eddie, which is what he's most famous as, was of course a professional himself for quite a number of years and rode with some of the, the top teams in the world. But he was very much in his father's shadow, not surprisingly, with a name like Merck's. And I would say that it's only really in retirement and in running his development team that he has emerged from that shadow and, and really forged his own identity. And it's clearly a role that he relishes. We talked a little bit about that. We started off talking about Adrian Costa, who wasn't exactly a revelation to Merck's. He was talking all week about what a great talent he was and how his numbers were exceptional. Uh, but he was even Merck's was a little bit surprised to see him finishing on the podium in Utah. More generally, I asked Axel what he looks for when he's recruiting his young riders. Well, I'm, I'm looking for talent. I'm looking for guys that have some results for sure. I ask my riders, you know, they were my biggest ally. You know, what do you think about that ride? Do you know him? Do you think his mentality will fit into our team system and the mentality of racing? Because not everybody is, is keen on that. 
and and once you you come in and you you if you don't want to be part of it i'll make sure that you are part of it and if you're not part of it then you're not going to be racing necessarily and that's uh, that's a hard line that i take and and that's something that they have to learn as soon as they come on i understand that a big part of the recruitment process is is the interview the, the chat that you have with them what what sort of things are you looking for in that conversation it's hard to tell it's kind of like a I would say gut feeling kind of thing, you know, and, and also the results and, and just to, it, it's more, it, that's actually the final point is like the, the, the talk on the phone and just to kind of get to know him a little bit and to see how he is. And I think that right away on training camp, they, they sense with the guys that I around, they kind of coach them into what, what to expect and how to expect and how I am and, and how the staff is and how, you know, the, the interaction is. It's a personality also. I don't, I don't want somebody necessarily to be expecting things from us. From us. We, are, we have everything to offer them, especially at this point in their career. And uh, I'm here to help them. And it, it's either they believe in me or they don't. And if they don't, they might as well go somewhere else. You obviously offer great support, but how do you balance offering great support without pampering with them, without offering too much? Because oh, I'm pretty, I think I'm pretty hard. I can be pretty hard, and I, I, you know what? I leave them a lot of freedom. I don't pamper them. I'm not on their asses all the time. I'm not calling them every week. Perfect example is that you know when when Adrian was was second in the stage in Nebo, I didn't go to the podium because he doesn't need me. But uh, two days ago, when he got dropped and lost time. Then I went to the podium because at that point he needed to have somebody there to calm him down, to reassure him, and to to have support. And that's what I'm there for. And that's valid for at that level. But so when when the rider is not feeling well, you know, he's not doing very good. They need me more when it's going bad. Then if, if if everything goes good, they don't need me. I'll send him a text and I talk to him and say congratulations. Keep going like that. That's awesome. What do you do? But they they, they don't really need me. They have all the staff around them that will do everything they they can to make him prepare that race this is a, you know, a spectacular result for an 18 year old kid how do you keep him progressing at, at a sustainable rate I suppose because it's a long career isn't it and cyclists tend to reach their peak in their late 20s well it's it's in order of, of keeping him calm point the mistakes he still makes just tell, kind of tell him this is the, the area where you still have room to improve and, and if, if you don't improve that it's great in, in Utah and it's great in races in the U.S., but you want to be a, a successful all rider in in in, uh, in Europe also, and and for that you need to be able to to ride in a peloton, to to find good positioning, to to technically and and, and bike handle skills have to be up there also because you know you know roads are more, way smaller in Europe than they are here. Here, if you're strong, it's easy to pass 20 guys if you just push the pedals. In Europe, if you have a bad positioning, you you won't make it. It is the toughest thing about working with young riders, though, holding them back in a way. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Because more and more uh, what happens is that the pro tour teams get scared that he's going to go somewhere else. So they approach him very early and they try to attract them and try to seduce him and try to offer him money. The best thing that I can, can that I say to them and, and that I always ask them to do is to talk to my ex-riders that have made the jump up. And to not, don't believe me. You don't have to believe me when I say it's a big step and it's a hard step. And, and going up too early is not a good thing for a long-term career. Uh, the best thing is to see and to talk to those guys and say, explain them why and, and what you've gone through and, and, and what the challenges were. And then make your decision based on that. And, and again, they have agents. If I will give them my opinion, regardless of what they do. And... Uh, I, I, that's that's the promise that I make to them in the beginning. And if I if I make a mistake, I'll, I'll apologize and, and say yeah, I was wrong. But most of the time, it's 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 worked out. As in, you know, if you work if you work with me and wait one more year, and, and we'll I'll promise you that I'll give you the opportunity. You'll benefit from it and you get stronger on it. And I think that's that's what's been working so well. You, you've had such success with with this this team over a few years now. You must have had approaches yourself from top teams have you is working with young riders something that you really want to do yeah i mean it's i'm passionate about it you know and uh this is this is my program this is my team and uh, i'm my own boss that's that's the number one thing uh, yes i've been approached and i've been offered jobs in different teams quite honestly never in a position where i could contribute to the, t- the performance of the team better um, if, it, if it's to be just another director that it's going to be a second car in tour pond no offense to to that race or any race it doesn't really interest me. If I can make an impact to, to young riders in that team maybe or, or a manager position or whatever it is, maybe in the, in the long term, I don't know. 
But I, all I can tell you is that I'm having a lot of fun with this. Uh, this is my program. This is my name that I carry around. This is my dad's name that I try to honor. And and I have great partners. And, and uh, you know, we'll take in consideration everything that comes my way. But uh, at the end of the day, as long as I can do this and I can be successful, I'm loving it. And, and I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. So don't go looking for Axel Merckx in a second team car at the Tour of Poland. But what about his young star, Adrian Costa? Costa was born and raised in the US to French parents. He had a brief spell at the end of 2016 as a stagiaire for Etics Quickstep. Uh, it was interrupted, sadly, by a, a nasty crash at the Tour of Britain, so perhaps didn't see the best of him in Etics Quickstep colours. He's also trained in the past with the Cannondale Drapak team, so he's very much keeping his options open uh, as regards a future professional career. He's back this year, 2017, with action with Axel Merckx's team. That was always the plan. He's delaying turning pro for the moment, but I expect it to happen sooner rather than later. Uh, When I spoke to him in Utah, he told me that in 2008, when he was, I guess, 10 years old, he went to a race and met Axel Merckx and asked for his autograph. I presume he was probably taken to the race by his parents. So Merckx was uh, somebody that made an early impression on him, but the the name I kept hearing in connection with uh, Adrian Costa was Greg LeMond, another prodigious talent from America. He has been compared to Le Monde a lot, even though Le Monde retired, of course, four years before Costa was born. I asked him about that, but I started asking him whether, with his French roots, he was brought up in a cycling family. Yeah, my grandpa was really into cycling, and I would watch a tour and stuff um, on TV in the summer. But no, I mean, no no racing or anything. So, But, I mean, obviously, being French, it's a little bit more part of the culture than it is in the U.S., so... <laughs> Yeah. Do you consider yourself French? I mean, you're American, but you speak French for yeah, a def- definitely consider myself both French and American, which is definitely it's definitely nice to be able to, you know, be at home in the U.S. and also be at home in France. So, made living in France super easy, and I love being there. I love the culture, and um, yeah, it's nice to get the kind of best of both worlds. <laughs> Um, how, can you tell me just briefly how you how you did get into cycling? I mean, you haven't been racing that long, and it seems that you've been winning pretty much from day one. Yeah, I mean, I started racing when I was 12, just local stuff in California where I used to live. But it's, it's always been something I've I've really loved. Um, like I said, watching the tour and memorize, I was memorizing all the riders' names when I was eight years old. Like you get the French magazine, and they do the tour edition with all the riders, their names, and everything, uh, and the bikes they're riding, and all that. So. I loved it, um, and yeah, just, just crazy dreams of dreams of cycling and being in the, in the races and stuff like that, so it's pretty incredible that, yeah, I almost have to pinch myself because the things I've been able to do um, already, I remember following the U23 Road Race Nationals, which for me right now, uh, that's honestly not like that important of a race, but I remember being in awe at the riders that were competing in that so yeah it's pretty incredible to kind of look back yeah I mean when I was younger I played a little bit of soccer but cycling's always really been been my passion a few comparisons I've heard this week to Greg LeMond uh, who was one of the last sort of Americans who yeah. burst onto the scene at such a young age yeah yeah it's actually it's funny because uh my old coach Harvey Nitz he was on the 7-Eleven team and he used to used to train with Greg all the time because they were both from California and <laughs> he was he's been telling me that since I was 14 years old so yeah it's kind of funny that um he was able to kind of see that in in the young version of myself and as i grow it, yeah it's an honor to be able to uh you know for people to even think of greg <laughs> you know in comparison with me so hopefully uh hopefully that just continues and if i if i'm able to achieve half of what he's done in his career that would be amazing when he was your age 18 he uh wrote down a list of goals for his career have you done a similar thing I did it for this season specifically. Um, I haven't done for longer term, but it's definitely nice to write things down. And I think I think that gives you, uh, I don't know, maybe more motivation, and it really uh, kind of allows you to put your thoughts down and really focus on what you really want to achieve. So, yeah, maybe I should uh, get busy uh, with a journal this this off season. Do you do you allow yourself to think the longer term? You know, if you're if you're thinking about what. Uh, a great career would look like what sort of races do you fancy right now it's hard like i've never raced at that level obviously here it's an hc race but um still there's quite a few continental teams so um being able to do like a world tour race that would really show me kind of where i'm at but yeah uh, there's there's no need to think that far ahead i think uh, 
just target the races I, I have available to me and uh, always give everything I can in those. And then I think the bigger races will just keep coming. Yeah, I mean, in terms of races that inspire me the most, I love the mountains and the long stage races. So a race like the Giro or the, I mean, obviously the Tour is the biggest, but the Giro, just the incredible scenery, the mountains, the struggle with the weather and just grueling stages and in the Dolomites. Um, that's what, really, that's what, that's kind of what I dream of. Um, but yeah, at this point, just keep going step by step. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thanks again to Rafa, our headline sponsor, and to Science and Sport for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast and allowing us to do this free weekly podcast as well as, of course, our daily shows at the Three Grand Tours. That was something we started last year and fully intend to continue this year. Thanks, too, to everybody who has signed up already as a friend of the podcast for 2017, especially to the many of you who have generously tipped in more than a tenner. It costs £10 to become a friend of the podcast, which will give you access to 11 Friends specials. There's a bonus episode already there behind the paywall. That's a recording of a show that Lionel, Francois Tomizo, a.k.a. Monsieur Bullshit, and I did in Edinburgh in December. To become a friend, go to thecyclingpodcast.com. Now, we've looked at one home for promising young riders, the prolific Action Hagen's Berman team in the US. Another, based in Spain, is Alberto Contador's foundation team, he runs an under-23 team and a junior team, both sponsored by Polar Tech, as well as a cycling school for even younger riders in Contador's hometown of Pinto, just outside Madrid. The under-23 and junior teams are perhaps not what you'd expect of teams bearing Contador's name, in that they don't seem to be exclusively results-driven, but far more holistic, which is probably a word that we will ban this year, but I'll sneak it in. I met some of the people involved in Contador's team at a training camp in Gran Canaria at the end of last year, including the man who, as well as managing Contador's career, runs the foundation. That's his brother, Fran. Fran told me all about the foundation's work. There are three main aims that they have. One is to raise awareness of stroke. Alberto Contador, of course, suffered a stroke himself some years ago early in his career. The second aim is to promote cycling as a means of transport, especially in disadvantaged areas or countries. Um, and the, the cycling school in Pinto is part of that. The third part of the, the foundation's work is in supporting and running the two racing teams, the junior team and the under-23 teams. And there have been persistent rumours over the years that that will eventually develop into a senior professional team, which may become a project for Alberto Contador in retirement. Anyway, here is Fran Contador, talking a little bit about the the foundation, especially the two teams, the development teams. And then we'll hear from Gary Smith, the chief executive of Polar Tech, who sponsors the teams. We work with a philosophy uh, very clear. We we need to help our riders in the development, like person and like cyclists. That the cyclist study is very important for us. And we work with values like honesty, uh, friendship, uh, work, teamwork, and sacrifice. For example, no. For us, it's most important to be good person, that uh, very good cyclist, or to have very good condition for the for the cycling. We we think uh, the cyclist of the future is the a global person, no? It's, it's with very good condition for the cycling, but also needs to be a good person and to have uh, values. <laughs> I don't know if uh, we'll be the team, no, but um, we we work uh, in this way. And we hope that in other countries, on, on also in our country, in Spain, we hope that there is more, more things like, like us. And yes, uh, it's, it's international because uh, for, the, for the formation of our riders, it's very important to have also riders of other countries. For the languages, for the culture, it's different. And also it's very important to go and, uh, to the races in other countries because it's the, the cycling is different in each country. And also, it's very important the internationality of our riders or, and to go to other countries to race because our the majority of our sponsors are international sponsors, like Polartec is from the USA. So they are interested not only in Spain, uh, for, uh, his interest in is also in the rest of Europe. We have uh, next year uh, one rider from the United Kingdom in the under-23 team, other from Portugal and other from uh, Italy. 
in the under 23 and in the junior we have a Belgian rider and uh, other from the Czech Republic. I'm Gary Smith, I'm the CEO of PolarTech. I personally first met uh, Alberto and Francisco uh, about two years ago at a, uh, an event for one of our customers, RH Plus in Italy, where they brought in a bunch of folks, including the foundation Contador, uh, Alberto's uh, junior development team, to uh, ride up the Gavia and just have a good time and, and test out some of the kit that we had been working with RH Plus on. And so that's, uh, that was the genesis of, of meeting them and getting to know them as people and getting to understand the mission of the foundation, uh, which is really quite compelling to not only just uh, develop young bike racers, but to develop them as people, as well as the, the broader mission of the foundation, which is to support the uh, brain stroke research. I was going to ask you yeah, what makes this team different. You've sort of hinted at it there, but over those two days that you met Alberto and Francisco, did they explain to you the, the whole ethos the philosophy behind the project yeah i guess uh, you know for us it was a much longer time frame the conversation developed and evolved over months i guess for me personally the first thing was that just getting to know uh, alberto and francisco as people they're just really warm wonderful nice people uh, alberto in particular you know it's difficult obviously to know anybody you know as a person from their public persona as a, as a celebrity racer you know in alberto's case but just you know, genuine, warm, caring people just watching the two brothers work together. You know, one is the racer, one is the manager. That in and of itself was was interesting for us and for me personally. Yeah, so as we got to know both them as people and what the, the whole team was about, you know, the broader purpose of the, the foundation, again, like I said, the word that just keeps coming back to me is compelling. There's lots of places for a brand like Polar Tech to, you know, place their money in their logo, but to do it where you're not only getting the visibility and the value for your bottom line, if you will, you know, as a, as a sponsorship opportunity, but you're also doing it with something that has a higher cause, you know, and in this case, like I say, developing young people, not just as bike riders, but as human beings so that they can be successful because, you know, most of them will not go on to be successful in the uh, in professional level of the sport, which is okay. That's just the way it works, you know, but to make sure that along the way they, they have a good time and they develop as people. And then, you know, the more serious aspect of the foundation around uh, the brain stroke research and support, you know, given Alberto's history uh, with his own brain stroke. How, how do they do that? You know, when you talk about developing them as people, did you get a sense of how that is a priority of, of the foundation, but how is it done with the young riders that they work with? Yeah, the most stark examples that I've witnessed is, you know, they're simply told, you know, they're, they're the team leaders and management, sports directors, coaches are very direct with them and say, look, you know, the probability of you making it as a professional athlete in the sport is, is very low. Therefore, it's really important that along the way that you build skills, life skills, you know, get a good education, learn how to be a good person, uh, gain value from the experience of traveling and uh, meeting people, you know, business people. They're always, you know, myself, for example, you know, whenever I've been engaged with the team directly, they're always incredibly polite, respectful, eager to learn. You know, we, we try to teach them, you know, when we interact with them and, and the team obviously, you know, sets the table so that that can happen. Something that Gary Smith and Fran Contador kept saying was that most of their riders in the under-23 team will not go on to professional careers which seems counterintuitive and counterproductive. It's not perhaps what you should be telling ambitious young riders, but at least it's realistic and honest. And it does seem to be part of the overall ethos, the philosophy of the teams. Several members of the under-23 team were in Gran Canaria. And one evening I sat down with one of them, Joanne Bo, and uh, asked him about how he came to be involved with the Contador Foundation team. There were three years, four, four years ago now, they started to a campus or training camp in, in October with 30 or 40 riders of age 16, 17 who wanted to enter the, the team. And we spent three days in Madrid and they do activities and talk with us and interviews. And they started to know which, each rider and if the qualities the rider had and their personality were good for the team. And after a week the, of the training camp, they, they sent us a, a message to the founders and said if we were in or, or not. So it sound, sounds almost like Big Brother House or something. How, how, how many of you were there and how many of you got into the uh, team? Uh, 40, 40 riders, more or less, in a, in a hotel in, in Pinti, Madrid. And, and it was a, a great experience because we get to know Fran, uh, all the staff. And when you come from a little team like me, 
you saw all that and it was like impressive all the material they had uh, the, the structure of the team everyone so it wasn't just based on cycling ability there was other things as well that they were testing yeah because they, they during the year they, they saw if you won races you are a good rider but the thing they looked in the in the training camp it was if you are a, a good um, friend or you like to work or you are an active person because they did not do any test with your bike or, or to see your, your, your strength. They only make us play like touch ball or something like that to watch how competitive you are. And, and in the personal interview with Fran, they asked you questions that they could see how you, you are. If you study, that's a very important thing for them. And with that, they they saw the seven or eight riders they wanted to be in the team. Yeah, Fran was saying that education is important. They they put an emphasis on riders continuing their studies. Are you still studying now? Yeah, I'm in university now, second year in university. And they like people to get used to study or don't let the studies in one side because nowadays when you go to a race, uh, you need to know how to talk to the, the press or have a minimum of culture of things. If you stop studying at 15 years old and focus on cycling, you may be very good, but you don't know maybe only your language Spanish, you don't know English, French or German. They also look that. In the personal interview, people who didn't study were a level below the people who were keep studying. What, what are you studying and where are you studying? In Valencia, University of Valencia, Science of Sports this year. And it's relation to sports. And you study something that can help you to understand how body works and apply it to, to the sport you, you practice, like in this case, cycling. Were you, were you on the, the Contador Foundation junior team before you joined, yeah. became part of the 23 team? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, I entered the first year junior after the, the, the campus they did. And uh, I stayed the two years junior, one under 23, and now the fourth year. And that method they have of selecting people, quite unusual. But does it, is it successful in the sense that are you a group of friends? Do you feel there is a special atmosphere on the team? Yeah, because if you just get the best riders of, the, of Spain, they, they could do that. Or, or from other countries, it would be maybe the best team of the world because the name of Alberto calls a lot the, the attention. And that way they will win everything. They will be the reference of the peloton. But maybe of the 14 riders they will have, 10 want to win only them. So... In the campus, they look uh, friendly people. Uh, people like to be with with other riders, or they don't mind to work. Today, you I work for you. Tomorrow, you work for me. And that way, in the junior, uh, works a lot because they're only two years difference, and they are winning nearly every race in Spain. And in the amateur, they are looking for the same thing. Uh, they started the first year with only first and second year under 23, and now we have the full category of. T- till the fourth year and I think this year we will be competitive and will work this method. We heard there from Joanne Bo, a 19 year old on the Contador Foundation team the under 23 team, a very engaging young fellow with excellent English. I hope you've enjoyed this episode looking at some of the young riders and development projects that are out there competing in a very tough environment. It isn't easy at all for these teams to get sponsors or to survive at all, given that although they are developing the next generation of professionals, there's no transfer or compensation system in cycling. So Teo Gagan Hart joins Team Sky and his old team gets nothing in return. Something that Axel Merckx spoke about and said that obviously... Such a system would make life much easier, although I'm not sure and I don't think he is sure how exactly it would be implemented. We'll try to feature some other young riders on the cycling podcast this year, as well as all the usual stuff and nonsense. And that will return next week when Lionel Burney and Daniel Freib will be back. And we'll no doubt be looking ahead to the Tour Down Under. Maybe we'll get Lionel to speculate on who might win and discussing other hot topics such as the strange white sleeves on the BMC kit, which have certainly caught my eye and not 
necessarily in a good way. Thank you for listening to the Cycling Podcast brought to you in association with Rafa and with thanks to Science and Sport. Our music is by 13 Senses and Glass Pear and our producer this week was Adam Bowie. You've been listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Thank you to Glass Pear for the music in this episode. For more information and to download more editions of the show, visit thecyclingpodcast.com.